You're listening to Discutafel podcast, your green audio about gardening, the outdoors and sustainability. It has been raining like this for ages, so it seems. The house sparrows don't mind, but I do. I want to work in the garden, but that doesn't seem to be a very good idea. The soil is much too wet. So, what will be the plan for today? Hmm, we might visit the museum. Hello again, this is episode number 164 of your green podcast, Discutafel. We released this episode on February the 29th, 2024. And as usual, you hear my voice, the voice of Yvonne Smit. As you may know, we release Dutch and English episodes of this podcast. And today you can listen to another episode in English. Let's delve ourselves into the British gardening like they, you, they used to be in former times. We visit the Garden Museum in London. The galleries there tell the story of gardens in Britain from the 1600s until today. And I will point out several nice-to-know facts. I mean, do you happen to know which flowers a soldier with the name of George Moore collected in World War I? Or do you know who the so-called weeding women were? Listen to our coverage and in 12 minutes time you know the answers. Imagine yourself standing alongside the river Thames in London. Just behind you, on the other river bank, the recently restored Big Ben looks as impressive and familiar as always. But before you in a, is a church. It's surrounded by trees and a small graveyard. You're walking to the entrance and inside you hear people chatting. And somewhere upstairs there seems to be a movie going on. You hear a presenter talking. Getting the picture? Well, follow me. Disco coverage. On Lambeth Palace Road, just across the River Thames, with a beautiful view on the Houses of Parliament and the famous Big Ben, is the Garden Museum. Its home is an old church, and in its museum are several exhibitions on gardens and gardening. King Charles III is the royal patron of the Garden Museum, and I'm in front of a portrait of him now, and the portrait shows His Majesty at his desk in his study on the Balmoral Estate. I can see an arrangement of massed flowers in this composition, and they came from the Burkhall Gardens on the Balmoral Estate. I'm in a part of the exhibition now which is, uh, is titled In the Garden. And um, what is a garden? Well, a garden is an open space set apart in which plants are cultivated. That's a garden in a short sentence. It can be public, it can be private, it can be designed or not designed. A garden can be indoors, in a conservatory or outside, and even on a roof. However, what connects every garden, from a Victorian park to a modern window box, is the continued activity of people in its maintenance and cultivation. 
and also in its enjoyment and use. And the galleries here tell the story of gardens in Britain from 1600 until today. In 1600, Queen Elizabeth I ruled and John Tradison had begun his career as the country's first great gardener. The first best-selling gardening book had been published. It was called The Gardener's Labyrinth and the writer was Thomas Hill. But nine of the ten plants which I can see in gardens nowadays had yet to be introduced to Britain. And things like the garden hose, the greenhouse and the lawn mower were yet to be invented. On my right I see a showcase with several um, journals, gardening journals and photographs. And the first thing I see is an um, specimen of the amateur gardening for town and country. The amateur gardening magazine from 1899 it is. And it, it, the title was founded in 1884. It was the first magazine designed specifically for the amateur gardener. It was Britain's first gardening weekly and it is still published today. In another showcase here with the theme of gardeners at war I see pressed flowers dating from 1918. George Moore was a soldier serving on the Balkan front during the First World War and he collected wild flowers and pressed them as a gift for his fiancée at home in Newcastle. I recognize here a papaver or field puppy. During the First World War, German submarines brought Britain close to starvation. And by 1918, over a million plots had been dug in parks, gardens and open land. By the Second World War, the government was prepared with a big dig for victory campaign. And the women's land army was recruited to replace male farmers and horticulturalists who had enlisted in the armed forces. Armies had to be fed, of course, and vegetables were cultivated behind the lines, in barracks or in prison camps. But gardens also had a spiritual relationship to war, because soldiers of all nations grew flowers in the trenches and picked flowers where they could. And here is a collection about private gardens, because uh, Britain has always been called a nation of gardeners, of course. And the private garden is a space we can make our own. Until the 19th century, a private garden was a privilege for the few. However, people of all backgrounds have always found ways of having flowers in their homes, from window boxes to bunches bought from the market. In the countryside, cottagers dedicated their gardens to growing food. Flowers were chosen for their attractiveness to bees and other wildlife. Records show that even the poorest of people have spent their limited money on seeds and bulbs. In the late 19th century, gardens increasingly became a place to play games, beginning with croquet and lawn tennis. Today, almost Half of the adults stayed gardening as a favorite leisure activity. However, in cities, access to gardens, gardens is becoming increasingly limited for less privileged and often younger people. 
For example, here in Lambeth, part of London where I am now, where the Garden Museum is, green space per head has decreased by 20% in the last decade. Two-thirds of residents do not have gardens of their own. It seems that if I had been here in the 18th century, on a summer night for instance, I would be able to see the ferry landing outside the west door of this church, crowded with visitors to Vauxhall Gardens, the most famous pleasure garden in Europe at that time. And the pleasure garden was a private enterprise with an admission fee. And for 10,000 of Londoners, every night it was a space for them to listen to music, eat supper with friends and simply enjoy the fresh air. Londoners could also enjoy commons. Um, there were wilder areas on which animals continued to graze. I know this system from the Netherlands. There it's called gement, common grounds shared with each other. In the 19th century, the state determined to create urban parks for everyone. And one reason was their value to the health of the urban poor. And it was claimed that the first London park, that was Victoria Park, increased the life expectancy of East Londoners by three years. And this corner of the museum is about making gardens, about garden tools. Tools make the garden. And there's a tool for every task in the gardening year, to dig, to turn soil. Well, I don't dig that much. I don't turn the soil at all, but some people do. There are tools to plant, to protect seeds, to harvest, to prune, etc., etc. So we see lots of things here, watering cans made of copper, made of plastic, lawn mowers. Spades, of course. Wheelbarrows. And also insecticides, slug death killer powder, it says. Best than weed control is a thing in gardening, of course. And making a garden has always been a battle with pests and weeds. And during the 17th century, weeding was often a task for poor women, known as weeding women. Pests were prevented by handmade bird scarers and cloches and early chemical pesticides such as extracts of tobacco and by the early 20th century chemicals were used on a large scale. By the 1950s most garden sheds had chemicals on their shelves. A reaction against these chemicals began with the publication of the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson in 1962 and has continued with the rise in a organic gardening, it says here in a note. Well, I see all these things on shelves, all these um, slug death powders and other products. I don't have them. I don't have them at all. I don't need them either. But it's part of garden history, and Discutava hopes it's not part of gardening's future. Discutava. 
Disco Finish. Thank you for listening to this coverage from the Garden Museum. I hope you still remember which flowers the soldier collected and who those weeding women were. But there's more to come on the Garden Museum because this museum also pays attention to garden art and garden design. And we made some recordings about those topics. Please listen to another episode of Discutafel, in which I will show you around the galleries on garden art and garden design. And I promise you an exciting bonus item as well. This second Garden Museum episode is due to be released later in 2024, so please stay tuned. The next two episodes will be in Dutch again. They are part of a series about food forests. And the next English episode has not yet been scheduled, but I do expect a coverage from Inverness Botanic Garden somewhere later this spring. And in the meantime, let's go outside, whatever the weather. And until next time... (laughs) 